Mackenzie Johnston with Tri-State Livestock News, bringing you discussions concerning fair cattle markets. Today we have the opportunity to chat with Harriet Hageman of Laramie County, Wyoming. Harriet is an attorney who has dedicated much of her professional career to protecting private property rights, water rights, and constitutional rights. So to start off with Harriet, can you just tell me a little bit about your background and your involvement within the cattle industry? Well, I grew up on a ranch about 100 miles north of Cheyenne, outside of Fort Laramie, Wyoming. And that ranch is still in my family. My brother Hugh runs that ranch with his family. My mother, until very recently, was living there. Um, and her house burned down last month, or actually in August. And so she's living with my sister in Torrington. But she has been there uh, for many, many years. Uh, I grew up on a cow-calf operation. and. That's what my family continues to operate um, in Goshen County. And I was raised doing everything from moving cows to fixing fence, to uh, irrigating, to farming, to doing whatever was necessary to raise livestock. Fantastic. And you are now a lawyer, correct? I am. I have been practicing law for over 31 years. So what do you feel are the major issues standing in the way of fair cattle markets today? Well, I think that what was pretty clear during the RCAF convention that I attended in August, as well as talking to my clients and talking to my brothers uh, about the cattle market is that the market is, is, is rather broken at this point in time. Um, what we see is that we only have the four big packers, and I think that that is impacting uh, the cattle market across the board. We basically are moving into or have moved into a monopolistic situation. And until that is addressed, I do not see that we're going to be able to fix the fundamental problems that we have with the market. What are your thoughts on the DOJ investigation into our big four beef packers? I think it's a long time in coming. I think that it's very obvious to anyone who pays attention to the market and pays attention to what has been happening, um, that there has been, that, that, that there needs to be some antitrust investigation into the four packers uh, into the markets, into the pricing, um, everything. Uh, you know, again, I, I grew up in this industry and you definitely would see fluctuations over the years, but gradually over time, you could see that the market would increase. And as, as prices increased at the grocery store, you were hopefully seeing that the cattle producers themselves were also benefiting from that. And the fact is that that isn't what's happening now. And there is a reason as to why, or there are reasons as to why we're seeing that. I think it's probably pretty obvious what is happening. I think that an investigation into the four packers and the arrangements uh, be, uh, among them, as well as other outside organizations is a long time in coming. I hope that we can actually get some real answers. There's been a lot of talk about increasing competition within our cattle markets. We've seen Senator Chuck Grassley bring forward the 5014 legislation. A couple weeks ago, Senator Fisher from Nebraska brought forward some legislation to uh, increase transparency and increase negotiated cash trade on a regional basis. Do you feel that uh, these types of legislation will increase competition within our cattle markets? Well, you hope so. You hope that these can be fixes, but I still think that the fundamental fix needs to go back to go looking at what is going on with our packers and the kind of arrangements that are being made in the back alleys or the, or the back rooms, if you will. Uh, I, I think that that's what we need to be looking at. We need to be finding out what has happened with the market and why. Um, we saw over the last six months with the coronavirus, the situation with the distribution chain and things like that. And, and I just think that there are some fundamental problems in the market right now. I'm hoping that some of this legislation can help fix it. But I think that there are other things that our congressional representatives should be doing as well. There's currently a petition circulating to bring about a referendum with our beef checkoff. What are your thoughts on this? I think it's, uh, again, it's long overdue. I don't believe that the beef checkoff program should have been placed for th in place for 35 plus years without that kind of a referendum. When you start looking at the beef checkoff program, what you realize is there is massive, massive, massive amounts of money involved. And as a result, you see money being spread around in areas and to industries and to groups and to further certain agendas that really ultimately are, um, are going to have negative consequences to the cattle industry itself, to our beef producers. 
So the Beef Checkoff Program and the related BQA program, the Beef Quality Assurance Program, are interrelated. You're seeing that Beef Checkoff money is going to, uh, to foster and to push forward with the BQA program. What I see as an attorney and what I see with, with, the, with the packers, what I see with the, what has been going on with the industry, is that the Beef Checkoff Program in large part has really benefited the packers in many, many ways. And at the same time, it has hurt the actual cattle industry, the brief, the cattle producers. Then you couple that with this beef check, with this BQA program, the Beef Quality Assurance Program, and the effort by the USDA to require our livestock producers to use RFID ear tags. And what you find is that it is an effort for the packers or third parties to dictate how our cattle industry is operated. All of this is an effort so that third parties, um, whether it be the World Wildlife Fund or it be the Packers or it be McDonald's or whomever it might be, it is to allow these third parties, these outside groups, to dictate how someone like my brothers have to operate their ranches, whether it has to do with how they're building their fences, how they may be um, uh, managing their water resources, whatever it might be, and we can talk about that in more detail. But what I see is that the Beef Checkoff Program hasn't done nearly enough to actually promote the cattle industry and the beef industry, but it has generated massive amounts of money that I think is being used inappropriately. I think that it is being misappropriated. I think it's being directed to the wrong things. I don't think that it's actually being directed to help the cattle industry itself. I think it's, it, it is being used to help third parties some of whom would like to see the cattle industry go away entirely and others who would like to see the cattle industry ver vertically integrated, none of which is for the benefit of our cattle producers. You speak about RFID tags. You, re you represented our calf in a lawsuit against the USDA requiring ranchers to use RFID tags. Can you elaborate on this lawsuit and how it played out? Sure. Let's go back to what an RFID ear tag is. It's called radio frequency identification. And starting in about 2011, at least for the public announcement by the USDA, they were going to look at what we needed to do in terms of uh, cattle identification and traceability in the United States. So they did a, a notice of proposed rulemaking at that time. They went out to the industry and they said, what do we want to use for official identification for livestock producers, cattle, well, all livestock producers, bison are involved, horses, chickens, different kinds of, of, of animals, different animals are involved with it. And they went out and, and did a rulemaking. And in 2013, the USDA issued a final rule for animal identification and traceability. The idea being that we want to make sure that if there is an issue with an animal, whether it's with BSE or something else, that a foot and mouth disease, whether there's something else that they, that they need to catch, that if they find an animal, they're able to trace it back to its origin and hopefully contain whatever that disease outbreak may be or limit it or restrict it or make sure that it doesn't happen in the first place. That's an admirable goal. But what happened is when they went to the industry, the industry was very clear that we have good identification and traceability techniques in place and have for well over 100 years. Uh, brands, ear tags, back tags, tattoos, um, there's a group identification numbers. There's a variety of techniques that are used by our cattle producers now and have been for a long, long time. And then new technologies that have come along that cattle producers have been adopting. So ultimately, the USDA recognized that the cattle industry itself was very opposed to a one-size-fits-all approach. And so for animal identification, they approved as official forms of identification Again, brands, back tags, ear tags, tattoos, and group identification numbers. And that was very clear that that's what the industry wanted. So that was the rule that was issued in 2013. Well, in April of 2019, a fact sheet, and I'll grab it here for you, um, a, a one, two-page document uh, magically appeared on the USDA's website. And what this fact sheet was about was it's entitled Advancing Animal Disease Traceability, a Plan to Achieve Electronic Identification in Cattle and Bison. 
And what this fact sheet did is completely nullified the 2013 final rule. And it said, if you are going to move your cattle interstate, they must have an RFID ear tag by January 1st, 2023. And all cattle and bison that do not have an RFID ear tag will not be allowed to be moved across state lines. Where that's very significant for someone who comes from Wyoming is we don't have packing plants in Wyoming. The vast majority of our cattle, our commercial herds, our, uh, our livestock producers, all of their cattle or the vast majority of their cattle must move across state lines at some point in its life cycle, whether it's going into a feedlot or it's going directly to slaughter. All of our cattle leaves the state and there are many other uh, states that are in a similar position because there are not very many packing plants in the United States. So it puts cattle producers in Wyoming at a distinct economic disadvantage. But from a legal standpoint, it was absolutely illegal. This was completely contrary to the 2013 regulation. In fact, the 2013 regulation specifically prohibited states and tribes from requiring livestock producers to use RFID ear tags. So that's how important this is. And from the standpoint of my law firm, the New Civil Liberties Alliance, we filed a lawsuit because we don't like this kind of stuff. We believe that the agencies absolutely have to follow the law. And the law in this case is the 2013 regulation. And until that's changed, USDA has no legal authority to adopt something like an RFID only requirement. So we were hired by RCAF and a couple of individual uh, ranchers, um, Donna and Tracy Hunt in Wyoming and Kenny and Roxy Fox in South Dakota. And we filed a lawsuit in federal district court in Wyoming challenging this fact sheet as violating the Administrative Procedures Act, a procedure act uh, violating the 2013 regulation and violating the Federal Advisory Committee Act because this fact sheet was put together by the USDA working in advice, working with an advisory committee, all of whom were RFID. In, in fact, the head of the, of the advisory committee is a gentleman who works for an ear tag manufacturing company. So what they did is, is we sued over this, challenged it and filed that lawsuit in federal district court in Wyoming. We filed that last October. Okay, and where is that lawsuit now? Well, it was interesting because I was actually being interviewed by the Wall Street Journal near the end of October of last year. And the woman who was interviewing me said, I just tried to find that fact sheet on the USDA website, but it's not there. Can you tell me where to find it? And so I went there and you get the 404 message. And what we realized is that they had surreptitiously pulled this fact sheet from the website but didn't give any notice, didn't tell anybody, just pulled it off of the website. Well, we immediately issued a, a press release saying, the fact sheet's disappeared, we don't know why, what's going on here, and the USDA was actually forced to come out and formally renounce this fact sheet and say, we're not moving forward with that program or that plan at this time, we are reassessing it, and um, so they withdrew the fact sheet. Um, and then the, uh, the U.S. attorney, the USDA, they filed a motion to dismiss our lawsuit, arguing that it was moot, that they had pulled the fact sheet. And so therefore, there was no reason to go forward with the lawsuit. Um, so Monday was the last day for producers and folks to submit comments to the USDA regarding um, this RFID transition. So where does the whole situation go from here? Well, what happened was we actually argued against dismissing the lawsuit because we knew that the USDA had not given up. And so we continued and we are continuing to pursue our FACA claim in the federal district court. We're arguing that we should actually be able to do discovery of the USDA folks and find out their involvement with this advisory committee so that we can demonstrate that all of the information that came from that advisory committee and that was put together to try to force RFID could actually be considered the fruit of the poisonous tree. And they'd have to go back to ground zero. They wouldn't be able to use that stuff. So right now we're still in federal district court. We've got a motion pending with the, with the judge asking that we be able to do discovery on the USDA and that decision has not yet been issued. As far as the USDA's continuing efforts to try to force RFID on the cattle industry, that in fact is going forward. And on July 7th, USDA issued a notice 
not a not a, not, a, not a rulemaking, not a proposed rulemaking. They issued a notice asking for comments about whether if you in fact use official ear tags on your on your livestock on your cattle that they must be RFID compliant. So they're trying to run, make an end run around our win in getting this fact sheet withdrawn. And so what they are attempting to do is surreptitiously, again, without doing a full rulemaking and without complying with the 2013 regulation, they're still trying to force the cattle industry to use RFID ear tags uh, in violation of the law. Um, but yes, the comment period ended Monday for that particular uh, announcement, that a particular guidance document. We have submitted comments. I know that a lot of other people, a lot of other individuals and cattle producers have, it, have issued comments or uh, filed comments. I assume that regardless of what the cattle industry wants, USDA is gonna go full steam ahead with trying to force RFID ear tags. And the reason I say that is because I'm fully aware of what the long-term plan is in terms of the USDA and the packers and the third parties that I was talking about earlier in our interview. And the long-term plan of what they're attempting to do with the livestock industry, it absolutely is dependent upon them getting RFID ear tags. When you speak of this long-term plan, what are you referring to? Are we talking about vertical integration? We're talking about vertical integration. We've seen it in the, uh, the, the, the poultry industry, we saw it in the pork industry, and the packers are attempting to do the exact same thing with the cattle industry. What you see right now, even with a Walmart, you know, Walmart is entering into contracts with only specific people for their beef products, uh, vertically integrating where they own the entire, the, the entire uh, chain uh, of production, and they want to do that with all of our independent cattle producers as well. What they, I think that what the long-term goal is, is that the Packers it, tend to own the vast majority of the ranchers and ranches in the United States, and they hire cattle producers as their hired men. They may be the managers, but I do believe that the long-term goal is vertical integration of the cattle industry. It's one of the last industry industries that is independent. Uh, and uh, it, it, it also, the cattle producers are the ones that, that own and control the vast majority of private property, especially in the Western United States. And so I think that what you are seeing and what the effort is, is that there is a push uh, for vertical integration to try to do away with independent cattle producers. And one of the, the problems that I have with RFID is that right now our cattle are an undifferentiated commodity. And what that means is, is that on sale day, whether it's a Wednesday in October in Torrington at the, at the, at the Torrington sale barn, you may have 6,000 head of cattle that go through there. And they can go through and they're tested and everything. And, and as long as there's no problem, it's just 6,000 head of cattle. If you RFID all of those, if you have one producer or if there's a producer that says that they're not going to do the BQA or they're not going to do something that the world wildlife demands in terms of their operations, then what can happen is that the, the, the packers can literally say, we are not going to accept cattle from that, that, that person, that rancher, that individual, and they can stop it at the sale barn. So RFID is not as much about traceability for disease as it is a mechanism by which the USDA and the packers are moving forward with trying to dictate operations for our cattle producers. And if, um, in, a, in Beef Magazine, I want to say maybe three or four months ago, there was an article saying exactly that. Um, what the article was an advocate of RFID said, consumers are demanding to know and to participate in and to have a voice in how cattle are, are managed and how ranches are operated. And this is the way that we do it. And everybody thinks that vertical integration is a bad thing, but it's not. And that's somebody who is an advocate of RFID and as someone who is who claims to be an advocate of the cattle industry, but he's not. He's not an advocate of the cattle industry. He is someone who is an advocate of vertical integration, which will do away with the in large part with, with our independent cattle producers. What can independent cattle producers do to try to avoid uh, vertical integration? What kind of efforts can be put forth to avoid this situation? 
Well, again, we talked about it earlier in, in this interview, and that is we have got to get to the bottom of what's going on with the antitrust issues with the Packers. Okay, so that's one of the issues right there. The other thing is that uh, the reason that the prices have been kept down for the cattle producers while they have been rising at the grocery store is that it's a real effort to break a lot of our cattle producers and force that vertical integration. That's another tactic that's being used right now. We had cool. Cool was adopted, country of origin labeling. And after this last six months and the pandemic, we all know that the vast, vast, vast majority of consumers, if they are able to purchase and consume American raised beef or lamb or poultry or pork, whatever it may be, that's what they're going to do. We don't need to be importing cattle, either live cattle or beef, from Mexico, from South America, from China, from countries that uh, don't have the same standards that we do. The reality is that the cattle industry and the beef industry in the United States is the safest in the world. We're importing our problems. We're importing the sub substandard product. And the, the, the fact is that if we get, or if we have country of origin labeling, what everybody knows is people are willing to pay more for that American raised beef than they are Chinese raised beef or South American raised beef or Brazilian raised beef. There isn't any other country in the world that has the standards that we do in the United States, both in terms of cattle production, as well as beef processing and production. So having cool, would allow us to charge more for American raised beef and it also would probably decrease the amount of imports that we're seeing. Right now, you may go to the grocery store and you may be buying Brazilian beef, you may be buying Wyoming beef, you don't know because our government won't protect, protect our brand. It won't protect our trademark of being American made. And I think it's one of the more important things that we could do is ensure that our consumers knew that what they could buy is safe and humanely raised American raised beef. And I think that that's one of the issues. Um, again, the Packers don't want that. USDA has fought it. Uh, it was repealed um, by some of our representatives that I thought should have been a lot more friendly to the cattle industry and preserving cool. But that's one of the things that our cattle producers need to do is they need to be fighting for cool. Um, we need to reassess the, the uh, beef checkoff program. The beef checkoff program is making some people extremely wealthy, but it's not necessarily promoting beef. When was the last time you saw an advertisement for beef on TV? When was, we, we all remember the advertisements, beef, it's what's for dinner. And that was the origin of the beef checkoff program. But when was the last time that you saw advertisements about beef on TV. That's what Beef Checkoff was supposed to do, but we don't see that kind of promotion the way that we should be. Um, and then again, that BQA stuff, we need to make sure that we do not have third parties dictating how we're running our operations because what they'll do is they will adopt standards and requirements that will break our independent cattle producers. So what do you see happening to the independent cattle producer if these changes aren't made if these issues aren't addressed. You see our industry going down the same path as pork and uh, poultry industries have went? You know, I hope not. I, I, I can't predict that. Um, I'm just an attorney <laughs> um, and I can't predict that. I, it, it's definitely a fear that I have. And as I have studied this issue over the last almost year and a half dealing with the, the RFID reading the articles, understanding the intent, understanding the motivation, looking at the amount of money that we're talking about. And there, there is a, there's, there's a lot of those beef checkoff dollars that are not going to the right place. And there's so much money associated with it that it's almost hard to track. You know, again, beef checkoff dollars should not be going to promoting BQA compliance. It just shouldn't. Because that BQA compliance, that 33 or 35 uh, point checklist, some of those things are absolutely fine. But the moment that you start making those things mandatory and having a third party be the person that gets to determine whether you're in compliance, that third party is going to come in and they're going to have an agenda that is not the same agenda as the cattle producer. Our cattle producers produce one of the top products in the entire world in terms of protein in terms of a healthy, uh, healthy for your diet, all of those things. 
our cattle industry is a success story on so many different levels. Um, and we don't want to destroy it. And some of the things that are going on out there with these mandates, with how our RFI or with how, how our uh, beef checkoff money is being used, what's going on with the packers, the shove and the push towards vertical integration, all of those things are not going to help the, the, the cattle industry. And ultimately, they're going to dramatically decrease the availability of beef and dramatically increase the price to the consumer. And none of us think that that's the right route to go. Um, we all are proponents of beef. We know the health uh, benefits of, eat, of having a, a beef diet, beef in your diet. We want our kids to have the availability of that protein. Um, and the, the things that I see coming from these groups and these efforts to, to try to take over the beef industry, or the cattle industry, I should say, um, are not going to, in the long run, be good for the United States, our consumers, or anybody really, except people who, a, a very limited few who can make an enormous amount of money. That is all I have for questions. Do you have any closing statements you'd like to make regarding uh, the cattle industry and our cattle markets? I, I again, I, I want to uh, congratulate. I want to, I, I want people to understand the quality product that our cattle producers are producing every single day. The amount of hard work that goes into it, the dedication that goes into it. It is, it is truly a calling. Having been raised in that industry, having family that are still in that industry, it is a calling. And these are people who have dedicated their lives to producing something that is really uh, very good, very beneficial, uh, not only in terms, of, in terms of, of food consumption, but at the same time in terms of their um, the, the, the manner in which they preserve and protect our lands. They are true stewards of the land, more so than almost anybody else could be, because everything that they do is dependent on their ability to care for uh, their pasture, their farm ground, their water resources, all of those things. At the same time, they pr uh, provide a, a massive amount of forage and grasslands for wildlife, water resources for wildlife. Our ranches in the Western United States have so dramatically increased or improved the environment. Um, and it's why we have the wealth of, of, of wildlife that we do, why we have the fisheries that we do, those kinds of things. I think they should be commended for what they've done. And I think that our leaders and our political leaders should be making sure that they are there protecting that industry because it's an incredibly important industry to the future of the United States.